Hello, I'm Rockin' the Barn Blog, and we continue our radical engagement series with Alex Ochili's postmortem of the millennial left, Almost with Eggshells on the Failure of the Millennial Left, where he reviews three books. Um, I have already disclosed my prior associations and biases there. You may also notice that my voice sounds a little bit rougher. I have a mild cold. Um, I decided to go ahead and get this done. So let us begin here today. In 2023, three books emerged that attempt to reckon with this history. Chris Catron's The Death of the Millennial Left is an ex is explicit in pronouncing fatality, asterisk. Uh, yeah, although we must remember that Catron's project was announcing the death of the left, although one suspects he was referring to the Gen X left at the time that he formed Platypus in 2006 um for the entire history of the organization um he happens to make a lot of i think correct observations though in his series of essays ones that we should take seriously i think and so let's continue here Catron sets out to demonstrate how this generation's failure as a product of past defeats and bad ideas that it internalized. Yeah. Journalist Vincent Bevins, as we burn, reconstructs a narrative of a global street process, taking any of the movement's horizontalism, which he held responsible for the missing revolution of the book's subtitle. Asterisk. Well, I think uh, Bevins is actually particularly insightful about the nature of horizontalism in the U.S. media. I think, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say it outright, I think his conclusions... Uh, about Leninism show uh, a dearth of understanding of the long historical array what he's talking about. And since I lived in many of the places that uh, Bevins is writing about and was not a journalist when I was there, I actually have different observations than what he gathered from the interviews he collected in his history here. I think in some ways Bevins is the most disappointing of the three books, but not because of his lack of excellent reporting. He's actually a, a jam up reporter and he's a pretty good scholar of the media, but what he isn't is a historian, nor is he a theorist. And he tries to make conclusions that require both. The eternal now does not really explain to you the long durée of the situation. Um, anyway, political scientist Anton Yeager and author Borrello's The Populist Moment deals with the third phase in which the left turned to electoral politics. This book drives at the contradictions of the populist gamble of trying to win without the social infrastructure that previous generations of the left had at their disposal. I've interviewed Jaeger on the show before. Um, I think that his observations about mass movements are fundamentally correct, although I don't think he actually pretty much ever has this has answered to me why these mass movements have fallen apart just that they have um and that this is a larger scale phenomenon than just you know the end of unions or whatever this is this is the bowling alone problem taken alone i find robert putnam somewhat convincing but i find putnam's answers and explanations as to what he's observing happening to be slightly less convincing furthermore um i think we have to deal with the way that the internet would both cut against putnam's thesis and then added to it something that i have yet to see fully and completely done um if you want to understand that i would check out my interview with uh anton yeager from about a year ago all right Taken together, the three works illustrate not just how protests and populism were characterized by their own internal cycles of growth and decay, but how the historical movement moment just passed represented a genuine opening, which we failed to through which we failed to step. Excuse me. For those of us who grew up in the deep freeze of the end of history, asterisk, the end of history is still with us. You are living through it, and asterisk. I don't know that the deep freeze was actually that deep. After all, the Soviet Union fell after 
uh, a lot of the 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 consensus of the early '90s happened. Wondering whether they're not there might ever be politics again, whether human beings might ever be might ever group together and rebel and try to change things. To reflect on the 2010s invites a certain bitterness. We should be angry. The 2010s gave the ma- gave us masses in the streets. Asterisk. We have masses in the streets in the aughts and the 90s too. And I think this is a millennial narcissism to some degree that we keep on insisting that it wasn't the case. Yes, there were more people in the streets than ever worldwide um, in the aught teens. But the trend lines have been heading that way since the middle 90s. Uh, and really, the only decades where you see breaks in that line would be the 50s and again in the, in the late 70s, 80s. And that should be something for us to think about. After all, the 60s, 70s gave us this whole idea of the protest to begin with. And we ended up quite possibly worse than where we started. I mean, that was also true in the 60s and 70s as well. But as always, real catastrophe would be not to learn any lessons or to learn the wrong ones. Millennial elegies. And if we burn, Vincent Bevins, a former correspondent in Brazil and then Southeast Asia for the leading U.S. newspapers, weaves a narrative from January 2010 to January 2020 that ties together the mass protests in Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, Yemen, Turkey, Brazil, Ukraine, Hong Kong, Kong, South Korea, and Chile. And already I see a problem, Um, you know, and that is there's a lot of the way those protests were presented to the West as similar that I don't think they were actually all that similar. Um, I think Chile and Brazil, uh, and to some degree, Hong Kong were horizontalist in the way that say Occupy was horizontalist. Um, and the ultra globalization movement in general was horizontalist, hunters, horizontalist. Um, I do not think you can actually say that about Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, Yemen. Turkey depends on where you're at. And Ukraine is a much more mixed issue. Bevins does seem to understand some of this. And I don't want to belittle that. But it it is something where it's kind of a problem to just say that those things can be kind of presented as one solid mass because they were experienced by a journalist in in a sequence of events. Okay, back to the story. Through the interviews with those who were there, asterisk, mostly um, people who spoke English um, and who were activist leaders as opposed to other more organic elements in the streets. And I think that's a problem. And it's a problem that Bevins realizes in the media portrayal of, say, Tahrir Square, right? But then he pretends that horizontalism extended to, like, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a ludicrous assertion. Um at least he does in the interviews that I've read by him. I would need to go through the book with a fine tooth comb to see if I agree with his other uh, assertions. I, I found that the media portrayal of what was going on in Egypt, even at the time, by by people who should have known better, like the journalist Robert Fisk, also made equal mistakes about the Brotherhood and the situation after Tahrir Square. Um, that just showed like massive naivete, and. Um, Bevins doesn't repeat that, but he follows a similar process. And I want to point out that they're both journalists. All right. Through the interviews of people who were there on the streets of Sao Paulo or in Tahrir Square or Madan, Bevins tells the story of the decade that surpassed any other in human in the history of human civilization and the number of its mass street demonstrations. I mean, yes. But also, there's more people now. Uh, Bevan's method is judging the movements by their own goals, uh, which I think is an interesting method. But that assumes that they understand their own goals. So we learned seven of these cases experienced a fate worse than failure. More than just a scorecard the author also in initial and final chapters traces the way the intellectual history shapes protest uh although i find when bevin speaks on this to be somewhat facile he misses some key things from the early modern period 
Because again, he's not a historian. He'll tell you that, but it's a problem. Through the tension between verticalism and horizontalism, all the already we have a false binary. I mean, verticalism could be fascist for all that I care. The idea that hierarchy and spo versus spont spont spontaneous self-organization is kind of ludicrous because their spontaneous hierarchy see the right. Um, and horizontalism does not necessarily equal spontaneity, uh, et cetera. And then the question of, of representation, meaning, and technological mediation. Appropriate to what mainstream media treated as social media-driven protests, Bevan summarizes the imagined life of the 2010s style protest in this style of a tweet. One, protests and crackdowns led to favorable media, uh, social, and traditional coverage. Yes. Uh, two, media coverage leads to more people in protest. We saw this in Occupy, too. Yes. Repeat until almost everyone is protesting. Yes. Four, five, a better society. The naivete runs right through the protests in place uh, as different as Chile and Turkey and it's Hong Kong. I mean, those are where the, the protests are the most alike, though, in it. Perhaps a product of the post-historical generation who really did think that if you got enough people and shouted loud enough, good things would happen. I don't know that they actually thought that. Or as a popular Egyptian blogger, Sam Monkey, explained via Lord of the Rings reference, he and those he fought aside, alongside in Trier Scare, believed that when Saren was defeated, all evil would simply disappear from the land. Get rid of McBollark, good things ensue. Well, in so much that they thought that, they were fooled, but I'm not so sure that I thought Morsi thought that. In the most tragic of circumstances, Libya, Syria, Ukraine, a protest became a kind of revolution, which became a civil war. Asterisk, revolutions are always civil wars, if they are military political revolutions. Sorry, it's not a kind of civil war. A revolution is a civil war. Period. Unless it is a revolution in technological development. Which becomes a bloody international quagmire. Bingo. What makes those different is they also become proxy wars for other people. Quote, we were very far from the digital world that Western leaders had envisioned. Bad things were happening all around and raising awareness was far from sufficient to stop them. I mean, no shit. Bevins pointly puts it. I mean, that's both poignant and also fucking vacuously obvious. Politics of whores of vacuum, the more organized are the, are, are the more powerful, then you will fill the gap. Well, except when they don't. <laughs> if you don't speak for yourself, I mean, in Libya, they did not. If you don't speak for yourself to say what you are for, someone else will. Absolutely. But this is conflating two separate problems. Like verticalism and the program of program or the problem of even orientation and spontaneity are different problems. And then another problem that you have is trying to get a movement mass enough to take power while making your program preemptively. Although a lot of people are not going to be attracted to your program in this initial instance. That's part of why this kept happening. It's not that people didn't have programs. There were a thousand sectarian groups both in the West and in these places that had programs. They did not catch on on their own, right? That's where history here is important more than just the eternal now of journalism. All the protests that Bevins reconstructs, quote, over, start over something very specific, then explode to include all kinds of people, accommodating U.S. competing and even contradictory visions. Finally, the resolution imposes very specific meaning once more in the middle infinite possibilities present themselves. Yeah, but that's true in any revolution, not just these kind of protests. That was true also in the February revolution, which is why the October revolution happened. That was true in the Mexican revolution, and that's why it wasn't settled until the center won with the help of people like Wilson and Zedin Puebla. I mean, that's not unique to the 2010s. To pretend that it's unique to the 2010s is to miss the point. Anton Yeager and Arthur Barilio, millennials like Bevins, yeah, all these people are younger than me, um, except for Catron, who's 10 years older, pick up the thread of the point that protesters decide to pursue electoral means focused on Western Europe and North America. Bevins is more concerned with the world beyond the core. I mean, yeah, and also no. Um, 
he reads the world beyond the core like a person from the core while complaining about the way people from the core read the evidence on the ground. And that's become clear in many interviews that he gives. The authors depict what seems to be an abrupt about face from the unorganized free for all demonstrations featuring every demand under the sun and none at all to formal political parties vying for governments through elections. Asterisk. I mean, everyone from Ron Tabor to like Wayne Price to the old Trotskyist party saw that this was going to be a problem. All right. Uh, what they didn't see is one would come into the other thing, but without really changing its character. That's interesting to think about. They were serious about organizing themselves in the parties, but as we discover, they were held back by a world in which the power of parties as such was weakened. Absolutely, but that's not... I think Jaeger and Borrello try to deal with that, but they don't really know, you know how to revive parties in this context. I don't think anyone does. Um, the context for how the parties came about is interesting. The, the mass, mass participation parties came about two ways. One, they were imposed from parties and factions within congressional par or parliaments themselves, as both America and Britain, or they came out of coalitions of mass movements that were not originally parties. That's Germany, that's parts of France, uh, etc. Uh, France is interesting because you have a little bit of both during the French Revolution. Um, so, and those all exist in the beginnings of mass media, but before mass media is the way, is as instantaneous as it is now. And that, again, is something to consider. All right. Maybe we should be materialist about this and start looking at what made this so much more likely and why is this a problem for the left in particular? All right. Some created a new, uh, new party out of nothing like the academics at uh, the Madrid Complun Complanese University, who birthed Podemos. It weren't entirely out of nothing. The Indignados movement was behind it, but yeah, it's still mostly out of nothing. Others transform existing parties, like Jean-Luc Mélenchon in France, who took parts of the Front de Gauche to generate La France Insoumise. Uh, France unbowed in English. Thank you. I have no idea how to pronounce French. In countries without proportional electoral systems, less populists avail themselves through the insider route, attempting to take over existing mainstream political parties like the Democrats or Labour. Asterisk. I don't know that they really tried to take over the Democrats. They tried to put a Bonapartist candidate in the executive of the Democrats. That's really about it. Um, the DSA's long game was never really there, and the squad only got, like, what, at a site, six people? Let's be real here. Although shared the same political grammar to orient, the, to orient themselves around the people, discarding the older left focus on the working class. You know, that's because no one can agree with what the working class is, though. That whole debate and limitation has also been bracketed out of this. The abandonment of traditional left symbolism was an attempt to respond to, to two crises. A short history of content and a long history of form, as Jago and Borriello put it, the economic crisis and austerity and the longer form crisis of politics, of representation and organization, and in a word, the void between state and citizens and the late political scientist Peter Marr revealed, uh, that the late political scientist Peter Marr revealed. What becomes clear is that populism in question refers to a strategy pursued within the left as a response to this crisis of politics, quote, all hope to rethink and revive the left by adopting po a populist identity either through the installation of new dramatic party machines or by the capture of existing sclerotic parties. We should therefore speak of a populist left rather than a left populism. And I think that, that that's, a, that's a distinction that actually does have some merit. Um, left populism implies an ideology that is pre-existing. Populist left actually implies a strategic orientation, one that may or may not have a coherent ideology. Right. All of Jaeger and Borrello's cases pass through the same process of constructing the people as a political subject, asterisk. You see this, though, in the beginning of the 1960s in the New Left. And it's not just from the anti-Stalinist part of it. It also came from the Maoist part of it. Um, probably more so from the Maoist part, part, part of it because it focused on the mass line and class collaborationism. The autonomous subject of this became interesting because the autonomous which implied class autonomy by the 90s were, in, were doing things as Hart and Aguirre talking about the multitude, which was just a real vaguer 
uh, vaguely French Italian jargon later way of of rebranding that at, uh, rebranding the mass line as you know more than the people so that we didn't fall back into Rousseauian or Jacobite or Jacobite not Jacobite language then finding a charismatic leader to embody their hopes dreams and demands now I hate to say this this is not unique to the left this has been in general a trend a trend of Bonapartism now, I have my theory as to why this is, and it goes back to Joseph Tainter, but I don't think Huchili or Yegor Bariello or Bevins or maybe even Chris Catrone would like that because it implies that this would be way more difficult to deal with than just, you know, uh, rebounding to the traditional ideas of the bourgeois order and the revolution as promised by communism or verticalism by whatever kind of thin notion of Leninism Bevins is pushing are i'm not actually quite sure what jaeger and Borello's positive suggestion is uh i think they're just more doing a post-mortem um all of them sought mass participation through across classes you know at, aka they were all collaborationists but with a particular emphasis on the following the lost generation young educated out uh, connected outsiders uh proletarianized or newly proletarianized professionals and when i say proletarianized i mean that literally not just ideologically i mean that they earned wages in professions that used to be petite bourgeois uh non-specialist doctors um lawyers teachers well teachers have not been petite bourgeois for a while but that's the unique case of quote the pmc unquote is that the PMC used to be professionals who had, strictly speaking, petite bourgeois relations, but they worked on rents, and that's what made them special. That's why uh, the Aaron Reichs tried to come up with a class name for them separately, uh, and also to distance themselves from the managerial class theses, which were really broad, that ran through both the right and the left after the 1940s, starting with James Burnham, also through Trotskyism, etc., The squeeze middle class that voted for the third wave progressive neoliberals in the previous decades, but who now fear joining the new poor of the long term unemployed and the surviving uh, industrial working class. Now, asterisk the surviving industrial working class in the Western core is a real small class. And the reason why I say that is if you include managers and logistics for it, not just workers themselves, you're only dealing with 10 percent, 10 to 12 percent of the working population according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And what I've seen in Europe, it's about the same. Um, if you bracket out management and logistics, it gets even smaller, significantly smaller, actually, because so much of it has been automated. The idea that nothing was made manufacturing in America is actually not true. Despite trade deficits, we pr we're one of the largest producers on the planet, usually in the top three, with all of Europe together, and then China rivaling us, although recently that's changed. Um, Europe's productivity has dropped significantly because Germany's has dropped significantly. And um, China has slowed down as well. Nonetheless, what I'm saying is it's not just that we don't make as much stuff here. It's that even though we make a lot of stuff here, we don't employ that many people in it. Socially necessary labor time has decreased because of the because of the incentives and inventions of automation computer technology etc all right so i mean it's a weird coalition you're looking at there the the squeeze middle class is actually 40 percent of the population roughly depending on how you define it and again middle class is notoriously vague um and the industrial working class is smaller and smaller. And, and, and not just in the developed world. In the developing world, too, it is also getting smaller. Automation cuts everywhere. All right. It is the latter's relative absence, which would, pro which would prove the most damaging to the left po uh, populist gamble. Yes. But I don't think most people actually thought about where that problem came from. And the book's strongest contribution is in making clear this tension between populism of the left and social de social democracy's populism, I mean, between populism of the left and social democracy. Populism arises at times when the organization necessary for social democracy is not present. 
Yeah. Uh, but that's also because there's not the organization. Uh, the organization necessary for social democracy says less than what you think it says. I mean, why was it present in the past and what created it? Uh, absent today are the trade unions, party branches, civic associations, athletic clubs, and the like that form the thick network of associations that provide a ballast for social democratic politics. Except that uh, the height of all these things is not when the height of social democratic politics really was, which that is, it's the height of Keynesianism and the post-war compromise. I would tell some people to go back and read some Paul Maddox Sr. on this, but that's just me. Uh, Back to Ojili. Notably, the book does not feature a sustained discussion of a program, a reflection surely of the platforms that, though they promised many decent policies, had little coherence needed to unify vision and policy in one. Absolutely true. And this was a problem with Bernie, too. Bernie even uh, pulled from opposed economic paradigms in what he promised to the general public, sometimes from old Keynesianism, sometimes from less populism, sometimes from socialism, sometimes from modern monetary theory kind of willy-nilly. So they eschewed the horizontalism of the early 2010s and protests and, and the 90s and aughts, guys. Don't forget that. Like, the, like, what's funny about this is if you really think that Bevins is right about like Hong Kong, Chile, and Turkey, what they were doing is actually mimicking the, the anti-war movement and the alter-globalization movement of the late 90s patterns, as was Occupy when it first instantiated. And when that failed, particularly when the Graeberite version of it failed, people immediately flipped it on its head towards more social democratic organization without looking at what brought social democratic organization into being in the first place which is more than just the wish for a program, despite what some people might try to tell you. The risk for the program is important, vital even, but it is not what started the situation. Let's continue. Between the leadership at the top and the masses of potential voters, there was nothing, a great big void. For the, all the novelty of left populism, what emerges is a picture where nothing really is all that new. Absolutely. Rather like the two elderly representatives of the Anglo-American leftists adopted as their respective standard bearers. I guess that means Biden and, oh, Corbyn and Sanders. Yes. Two relics of the new left. I mean, we need to put put that, that down there. And two relics of the new left who became prominent because of the exhaustion of the, of the Blairite Center of people a generation younger than them within their parties. The intellectual inspiration came from Latin America. Uh, this is a little bit not just from Latin America. The Argentinian theorist Ernesto Lacroix was the thinker who urged leftists to drop the rhetoric and symbolism of the proletariat and fable of the people that could be constructed discursively in opposition and in contestation with the elite. Uh, basically, Lacroix was telling the left to mimic the populist right, which, which you know, goes back to the 1930s. What is interesting about that is I don't think it was just Lacroix. I mean, Hart and Gary did it too. And Hart and Gary were bestsellers at the end of the 1990s. Uh, it is weird for an Italian theoretical Marxist book to be on the New York Times bestseller list, yet Empire was. We forgot it, but it was. This was an adaption to the South American context in which formal working class was a small minority among laboring masses. And thus, the industrial training unions would not serve as a building box of party organization. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's also true, by the way, in the United States, but for different reasons. In fact, almost the opposite reasons. One, you have an underdeveloped uh, industrial capital sector. And in the other, you have an overdeveloped industrial capital sector. Um, and there you go. The influence was mostly self-conscious in Spain, where Latin Americanization was the explicit goal of Podemos. And Gandhar to win became the key word of populism without apology, which I critiqued at the time. I gave myself credit for that. Uh, anyway, but they did not win. They all went through the same cycle of early electoral breakthrough with generated high expectations, followed by a period of institutionalization marked by scandals or internal tensions. Absolutely. And this went, I mean, arguably the least successful of that were the Sandinistas and the squad and the DSA because they had the least influence on their party, but they have also been purged the least too. So who knows? 
what's you know what's likely to take out the DSA is more lack of money than anything else. Uh, and that lack of money came from predicting unsustainable growth rates forever, which they're now not getting. <laughs> the tendency of the rate of cadres to fall. Um, the cycle then comes to a close as a relative failure leads to a downscaling of ambition. Left populist campaigns, much like the mass protests that gave birth to them, were confounded by a void where, medi uh, where mediating organizations and the organized working class could give them weight and strength should have been. Yeah, but the thing is, they were trying to bring back the organized working class with the kind of it was a catch 22 the whole time. And, and this was obvious to me at the time you were trying to bring about a political organization that relied on the working class to create the space for the old electoral working class organizations, both electoral and non-electoral to come back. Um, but that required you to win to do that. It was a catch 22. All right. The, they tried to do socialism without the masses and failed. Well, they tried to do socialism for the masses, but without the masses, all right? And both is a problem. Socialism is about working class power. Now, the reason why it's working class power isn't because the working class are like innately special. It's because in theoretical terms, they're the people who can actually make stuff. They know how to do it and are skilled. They know how to do that, but have no investment in the property scheme of the larger society. The most they might have is the property of their homes. And that's a big if. And thus, um, they are unable to, uh, they are in a unique space, unable to continue uh, to amass property within the system, and thus also able to reproduce themselves during it, so they can remake society if they are skilled enough. Now, asterisk, there's another problem here. And that is whether or not they're still skilled enough. But that's why the working class was seen as the ability to end class society. All right. The reason why it was seen as being able to do that is because everybody could become workers. It is not because the workers as they currently exist are inherently special. And that's an issue. When not really understood by many socialists today, I'm not sure they understood the majority of these authors. Although I would say Chris Catrone probably does have an inkling of it. Um, for all of the crap I give Chris, I think out of these books, Catrones is the one that I am uh, the most familiar with, but also the most critic, uh, the most critically endorsing of. There we go. Of the three books, it is in Chris Catrone's contribution that the point is the most underscored. Catrone is the original lead organizer of the Platypus Affiliated Society, a group whose name reflects the central idea that if an authentic Marxian left were to emerge today, it would be unrecognizable, unclassifiable. It would be a planet plus. Uh, this is so because, in Catron's account, the left itself has become so distorted by the experience of defeat and the experience of capitalism and regression of bourgeois society as a whole. I mean, like, let's give, let's give a full account of what Chris thinks here. I mean, he'll probably add more to that. Um, that it hardly recognizes his own traditions. Not surprisingly, from a group that declares that the left is dead and has declared it since it began, it, it is mostly despised by fellow leftists. Back of cover endorsements are hilariously all condemnatory. Catrone's book is distinctive in this trio in that it is not a retrospective account, but a running chronicle of the millennial left's key moments. Yeah, he wrote it in real time. I read many of these articles uh, that are chapters in this book when they came out as articles in the Platypus Review and, and other places. Composed of contemporaneous political essays originally published between 2006 and 2022, now pulled together by Sublation's publisher, Douglas Lane, it forms an inadvertent history of the millennial left. Fair enough and true enough. In a 2009 essay, Katron remarks upon the absence of the left that could be meaningfully critiqued and pushed forward. Nonetheless, the global crisis provided quote, better ground for the left than the U.S. wars of the 2000s have been, the issue of capitalism had reemerged. I think Katron was right about that, by the way. Uh, but, you know, everyone from Michael Albert to uh, and David Harvey would agree with him on that, not people that would normally agree with Katron, quote. But the left 
thought that the uh, new neoliberal era would simply be reversed with progressive policies, reflecting the fact that it never properly understood the crisis of the Keynesian Ford estate. Absolutely. It's only beginning to now. Only Gabriel Winnat's one of the few people who actually picked up on, and from a completely different perspective, what Catron was going on about. That the Keynesian Ford estate uh, created the public-private partnerships and made neoliberalism possible in the first place. I mean, Gabriel uh, Gabriel Winant's book on hospitals and their relationship to former factory cities makes this very clear. And it's something I've thought about for a long time, too. Uh, Catrone put this seed in my head in 2011, 2012, and it really came out when I started looking at the way public-private partnerships uh, going even back before Fordian Keynesianism. It goes back to uh, what Bukharin's talking about and the development of monopoly state capital, which means something different in Bukharin than it does in, say, Hilferding or later on Sweezy. Um, that the that while you know we know now that basically the Adam Smith idea that the state was not involved in the market was never true, um, and although Smith didn't think that, Smith actually thought you had to get the state out of the market. Uh, um, that it wasn't that was an active project that wasn't happening. Nonetheless, uh, uh, that myth came later, and thus the age of you know heroic entrepreneurial capitalism was over by the beginning of the 20th century. This led to a bunch of theories um, that got recycled again in the 60s and 70s during the the Keynesian Fortis period, and then got dropped as soon as uh, neoliberalism reared its head. All right. So the reasons why neoliberalism provided, provided a solution of sorts. I, I think it provided more than a solution of sorts, which is why the Mount Pelion ideas could catch on. But I don't think the Mount Pelion ideas actually caused neoliberalism. They gave it a form and a shape. And they directed a lot of policy. I'm not going to... But Keynesianism was failing. There were other alternatives, ordo liberalism, um, entrepreneurial capital, etc. Those alternatives would not as likely have been successful at restoring profitability without massive, massive costs. And after World War II and the development of nuclear bombs and all the other war apparatus by the newly super strong states that didn't exist in the 19th century, we really do see a need to deal with this without war. All right. Moreover, the status quo ante uh, to which the millennial left appealed, the social democratic settlement, had not been progressive, but rather regressive in terms of social emancipation. I mean, there's a reason why the social democratic settlement and the Keynesian Florida state were originally opposed, were originally opposed by the new left and then defended by them later. Reading history backwards, the grand compromise of the post-war era, workers uh, get higher wages and welfare in exchange for not rocking the boat, aka that's, you know, this is also the third worldist narrative about this. I actually think that's not true. That wasn't really the exchange. Um, but that was maybe some of the exchange that, um, that also what happened is there was so much capital destroyed in World War II that there was places for all this excess production to go. Was a defeat from the perspective of the dreams of the interwar, let alone 19th century socialism. Remarking on the first Sanders campaign, Catrone asked whether it represented a potential political turn or instead a last gasp of Occupy activism. I mean, I think Catrone was even clearer when he said it was basically the dying, the dying yelp of the of the new left of the 70s uh, before growing up and joining the fold of the Democrats. Yes, I think that's part of what happened. I mean, Sanders himself more or less joined the fold of the Democrats by the end of the by the beginning of the Biden administration. Similarly, observing the era of spring in the essay entitled "The Cry of Protest Before Accommodation," Catrone compares the 1960s and 2010 protests and warns that the revolution not not be the one that the protests were, want, but rather the one use their discontents for other purposes. Yeah, the military restored itself. Uh, both proved correct, even if the cost of of being proved wrong when pessimistic are much lower than when being optimistic. Absolutely. Um, I was I would add to that, though, that while that's true, it's also fairly well vague. One can look at history and see that that happens more often than not. That's not as predictive as one would hope. That said, one's still got to give Chris credit for seeing the historical trends there. I don't think he would say he was he was Nostradamusing that. Um 
for all of Chris's searching and deep historical critique of the millennial left, whose failures are mere iterations on previous failures, one is left with a sense of something strangely apolitical, or what Marx would call political indifferentism. Marx actually called political indifferentism was a, one of his terms for anarchism, so I don't think that's actually totally what's going on, Chris. Uh, what what may accuse Chris of typologism or economism, depending on what you actually think he means. I don't think either is truly fair. Um, typologism, believing in like strong schemas. If every struggle is corrupted by its limited and complicit nature, then what would Catron have the millennial leftists do other than read the classics? I mean, that is what Platypus more or less does. So, uh, like a fair dig, I guess, maybe. Uh, the other thing Platypus wanted to do, though, to be fair to it, is separately from the Platypus project, its key leaders wanted to form another project for a socialist party in America, which would try to revitalize the somewhat flagging SPUSA. Uh, in the aught teens themselves, it seems to have not gone anywhere because all the steam was taken out by the Sanders movement. Uh, so this is to say that this is not to say that like Catron just wanted them to wait apolitically for the eschatology of the real linen to emerge from history. Although sometimes he does talk that way. Um, yes, Millennial Left played its cards badly, as did the you left, as did the 1930s left. And this is where I think I would tell um, everyone reading these books to go back and read uh, the contemporaneous accounts of the new left by Trotskyist, uh, by former Black Panthers, and by uh, Max Elbaum. Um, that's not contemporaneous, it's later, but he was at least there. Um, and by uh, Christopher Lash, The Agony of the American Left, The World of Nations, etc. Because it makes clear that this was a long durée problem that had antecedents, particularly in the United States, going back to the 1880s and 1890s. All right. We are dealing with a 150-year-old tradition in the U.S., separate from the European tradition, although they overlap and interrelate constantly. One can hardly separate them out. After all, Marx worked for U.S. newspapers, the first person, the, pr uh, the first real group to make a big deal of the critique of the Goethe program in English were Daniel de Leon's people, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at least it sat down at a table and played online poker and not a quadrille or speculation or whatever was popular in the 19th century. I mean, it, one of the, that's a, a Ho Chi's crypto dig at, at basically uh, applying the Catron's position is like uh, archaeo Trotskyism. <laughs> um, anyway, now we face the pendulum of a capitalist politics swinging away from a free market period and towards a state centric one. Yeah. One that we see go back and forth in history anyway. One that one can see going back and forth in history in the 19th century, much less the 20th and 21st. Back to government regulations over neoliberalism, but under worse conditions. Yeah. Uh, what What is it that Brenner calls it? Um, uh, Keynesianism without profits, or as I like to call it, Keynesianism that doesn't work. <laughs> um, Catron is glum, seeing liberal cosmopolitan movements as more propitious. This is surely wrong. The periods of more public capitalism allow for consistation over what the state promises, but they don't, but doesn't deliver. The past 40 years have seen the absence of promises in which responsibility for outcomes has been outsourced to individual citizens. Absolutely. Well, yes, absolutely. I agree with Ho Chi Lee on this. This cynical pri privatism is an abnegation of authority on the part of political elites. Yes. I wholeheartedly agree, Alex. The result has been a citizenry operating on extremely reduced expectations. The millennial left at least sought to raise them in however limited and backward-looking a fashion. Four problematics thus suggest themselves for a new generation of the left seeking to respond to the mass protest and ballot box revolts, organization, media, rupture, and tradition. And those are all big. And we're going to stop here on this. You can already see that I have some minor contestations with Alex, in addition to contestation with these books. Um, I share Alex's skepticism of what Cotron seems to be as an, uh, the answer, which is basically 19th century bourgeois uh, development manifesting in the communism, although uh, Chris being a, a methodological Marxist par excellence actually is pretty, pretty uh, 
big on not entirely stating what that's going to be because he probably doesn't feel like he can. Um, you know, there are other answers to this. There's the cosmonaut Neokowskian answer. There's uh, uh, Noonan's answer, neither verticalism nor horizontalism, um, which is, while I, I, I still think Nunes is vague, it's closer to my position as well. Um, but we do have to deal with these four things, uh, organization, media, rupture, and tradition, and we'll deal with the problematics in the future. Like and subscribe. We have a Patreon. You can find more behind the paywall. Uh, comment. If you listen to the podcast form of the interviews, the free podcast, you can always use more reviews and uh, share and share alike. Thank you and have a great day.